I'm going to talk about uh, two games. So mostly I'm going to talk about this property, EVE Online, which is a science fiction game set 20,000 years in the future. Now, uh, just to start it off, I'm going to show you a little trailer which kind of sets the, explains the setting of the game, kind of a role play, uh, uh, role play esque version of, of the setting, which uh, came out a couple of years ago. Earth, the origin of our ancestors. century had passed since they discovered the Eve Gate. A wormhole. Passage to a remote corner of the universe. New Eden. It was the largest colonization effort in the history of man. The mass settlement of hundreds of strange new worlds. We thought nothing could stop us. After the Eve Gate collapsed, countless colonies perished. The scattered survivors forgot the old world. Fragments of mankind light years apart, lost contact. Thousands of dark years passed until humanity rose again to be with the stars. In different corners of New Eden, great empires had evolved. Four different faces of humanity. When they clashed, the wars were merciless. Out of the years of conflict, a new kind of human emerged. One capable of immortal life. To transform into this rare breed, we pay the ultimate price. At the moment of death, our mind is transferred to a fresh clone. We have become immortal. In the sky, we reach farther. On the ground, we strike harder. The empires are losing their grasp on power. And as our age begins to dawn, they will learn to fear us. So yeah, that was the universe of EU Online. Uh, the protagonists of EU Online are these immortal capsuleers, people who have conquered death by means of uh, mind, uh, uh, the ability to read their minds into the contents of a computer and cloning. So they're able to transfer the contents of, of a dying body onto a fresh clone of the same type. And these capsuleers roam the heavens, connected to their spaceships, commanding their spaceships, basically with their brain and with their emotions, uh, fielding the largest machines ever built, massive titans, and a mass more power than uh, nation states, or the empires which inhabit the world as well. These are all descendants of man. They came through this wormhole uh, roughly like 20,000 years ago. 
and uh, in Eve there are no monsters, there are no slimy aliens or, or any sentient life other than human. And the, and, the, and the thinking behind that from a design perspective was that the most horrible and terrible things that have ever been done to humans have always been done by other humans, not by monsters or, or, or aliens or, or tentacled monsters. Now the, the pilots are not all violent, they conduct all kinds of things, they, they mine asteroids, they do industry, they, they go about their business and the game simulates this in detail. And there's also a heavy uh, element of exploration and, and mystery to, to the game itself. And when you die, which you eventually will, you get cloned and get born again into the space station in, into which, uh, into which uh, your clone is stored. Losing only your starship, your crew, and perhaps a little bit of your memory. But, uh, but your kind of soul or, or, or consciousness moves on. This is, of course, it's a very secular game, so there's no concept of a soul. And I guess uh, Richard Dawkins would uh, agree. And one of the inspirations for the game comes from his book, this 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. We talked a lot about emergence. About, it talks a lot about very simple systems, like cellular automata, in his case, he talks about DNA as the most simple system, which uh, over a long period of time, and if you have a lot of them over a long period of time, doing tiny muta mutations and tiny changes, you can have the most complex and beautiful systems arise from very simple rules. And that, that, that's kind of one of the design principles of the game. It's also, of course, heavily inspired by the multi-user dungeons, the original adventure games, which many university students became addicted to in the 80s and the 90s. These were played on mainframes, but they were, were multiplayer games, which was fairly unique for that era, networked multiplayer games, but only playable on, 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 on mainframes, which are not accessible by the common man. And then, of course, the British game Elite, which came out in 1984, which is actually being redone now, and Elite was a massive inspiration because it was a procedurally generated universe with a very complex economy, a very complex map and a complex universe that was actually able to fit onto the 32K of the computer onto which it was written. Uh, but but uh, it was not only for its technical achievement, but it was rather for the fact that the game gave you complete freedom. It didn't have missions and it didn't have quests. It was like a simulation of this vast universe into which you could define your own uh, identity, whether it was to be a pirate or a, or a trader or industrialist or a miner, only through your behavior. So you never made that conscious choice. You never selected miner or selected trader. You just went out and find, and you went out and traded, and that made you a trader. And, and then finally, Ultima Online, which was a pivotal massively multiplayer game, which kind of established the genre in a way, at least the graphical aspects of the genre in 1997. Ultima was in many ways more open than its uh, subsequent imitations, like World of Warcraft. Uh, in Ultima, for example, you could, by means of exploiting the game, you could break into anyone's house. You could attack people in the middle of the street. There were no safe areas. You could, and, and you, had, you, could, you had people who were called player killers who used to do this for fun. They would attack innocent uh, game players, st steal their clothes, break into their houses, steal their stuff, which infuriated players. And many players asked that this feature be turned off or asked that uh, they be protected. But what happened in the meantime is that players started bunting together, the good players, and and hunting down the player killers. So you had bands of vigilantes, essentially, uh, in an emergent fashion, springing up and, and providing a balance to this kind of force of evil. So what we observed in, in Ultima was when you, with, with the lack of rules, then, you, then players themselves were forced to make up their own rules and generate their own society. And that was a big inspiration. And, and of course, using people as content, which, which today, isn't such a revolutionary idea with the advent of social networking, but you should keep in mind that Eve uh, is published in 2003, and this is before Facebook and before, uh, before a lot of social networking kind of um, sites and uh, technologies emerged. It was not the first social network, definitely, but, 
but this idea to use people and the human interaction as the content rather than linear content also sprung from the fact that there was just 30 people that in the development team in, in Iceland on a, on a tight budget on a tight time scale and we were not able to generate for example all of the linear content which for example World of Warcraft provides which provides uh, literally thousands of missions or a vast area. Another key principle to the design of EVE is the kind of perpetual machine of it. Of course, this is illustrating the water cycle, but in EVE, the cycle goes something like this. You, you get a spaceship and a little mining laser. You go out and you mine an asteroid. With the asteroid, you get ore. You take the ore and you refine it into minerals. You take the minerals, either sell them or, or uh, to someone else, or, or perhaps you take, use them yourself and take a blueprint for a, a spaceship and manufacture a spaceship, and manufacture uh, weapons, and, and you go out and you fight other players so that you can uh, get access to more asteroids and more, uh, uh, more resources, and you may be killed, and your spaceship may be blown up, and that is then salvaged, and again, turned into minerals, which are then are made into different spaceships, and so on. And so there's this cycle of materials, and and logistics that's it's ever evolving, although it's, it's hard to keep that in balance, just like with any ecosystem. But that's kind of a, a principle to Eve, that the, there's as little magic as possible, that things don't magically appear or disappear. They always come from somewhere and go somewhere. And this is what the game looked like in 2003. It has improved considerably. It, the graphics have changed and evolved, and the user interface has, has also changed. But, but uh, the game does suffer from the fact that it was built upon design principles and user interface paradigms which were prevalent in 2003. And uh, when you have a legacy product like this, which evolves on its own and, 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 and it's been updated with big updates twice a year since then, uh, it can be hard to kind of swing it back or adapt it to whatever's going on right now in the, in the space of user interface and user interaction design. So it still inherits a lot of elements uh, which kind of remind you of operating systems, whether it's like the Macintosh operating system or, or Windows 95 even, uh, which has been kind of hard to unwind and that's been a major struggle because when you have a captive audience and we have like up to half a million subscribers and, and you're, you're trying to make dramatic changes to the product that they love, it's, it's a bit like when Facebook changes their font and you have almost riots in the streets. People don't uh, like change. We changed the font at one point so that you could distinguish the letter O and zero and letter E and three and I think seven percent of our community, five or seven percent of our community violently like disagreed with the changes when it was lobbying to for us to change it back. So making large-scale uh, user interface changes to a legacy uh, uh, product like this can be quite tough. Like I said, in space, our players do a lot of mining and they do a lot of industry and they do a lot of trading as well. And sometimes Eve has been called spreadsheets in space, where people make fun of how, how like, detailed and how like, intricate the user interface is and how much of the game is played like this, rather than you know, through objects on the market. But this is serious stuff and, and, and the market and even the economy uh, are based upon the supply and demand mechanics that drive common stock markets, like the New York Stock Exchange. That was kind of the model that we, we based it on. The, all of the players in EVE Online play on the same server, so they share the same economy and the same ecosystem. That generates a far more interesting pattern, far more interesting signals in the data than uh, if we would run them on different servers only with a few thousand players on each server. <clears throat> and, uh, however, the game has become uh, quite complex and, and that's also a challenge when we're bringing in new players. So players which were attracted to the game in 2003, and 2004, 2005 found it easier to learn than, than people who were brought up using tablet computers, brought up using uh, more modern interfaces and, and more uh, simple and accessible means of using computers. Most of the people that uh, play EVE were people who uh, used to configure IRQ settings on their computers when they were trying to like run games from DOS or something like that. The average age of the EVE player is 28 years. And 
and also describing and, and illustrating what happens in Eve can become complex and hard to explain to, to someone who doesn't play the game. And this is the challenge with all MMOs. So something very interesting may happen, but it's hard to describe it. Now, the players self-organize into corporations, and these corporations then organize into alliances. And these alliances can be very large, up to 40,000 people in each alliance. And they have a very hierarchical com uh, command structure. And, uh, and, and the uh, interactions between the, the players are as complex as with uh, a community or a city of 300,000. All these different relationships and different uh, friendships and, and and enemies, and, and, and this is a battle, for example, which occurred in game, which is called the Battle of Asakai, which was triggered by an accident, kind of accidental use of a user interface, where, where a pilot of a Titan, one of Eve's largest ships, accidentally warped uh, or uh, actually jumped into an enemy system, triggering uh, an attack on the Titan, which then meant that the, the pilots in the same corporation as the uh, Titan owner was in, started piling in their own ships, and before you know it, over 7,000 players were engaged in a battle that lasted for hours. What the servers do at this point in time is they, in order to process all the information and process all the players, they slow down time. So not only did you have like 3,000 people on screen or more, you also had sl time slowed down considerably. So what was a great experience for the EVE players was kind of hard to describe for the outside player. That's kind of what I'm getting at. But Eve, for the people that know how to play it and learn it, uh, love it, evokes a lot of emotions, more emotions than just your average fear, excitement, or tension, or whatever that your average shooter might think, because of the social structures, because they have corporations, because they work together in uh, mining. They work together in running missions, in, in building the wealth of the corporation so that the corporation can build massive spaceships so that they can go, go into war. Now, there's a backstory to Eve, and there's a lot of drama to Eve, and which I showed in the, in the, play, in the trailer that came uh, uh, before the presentation. Uh, but something interesting started to happen. We started hearing stories about things that happened in Eve which we didn't write. And we didn't hear these stories necessarily from the players. We started reading about them in the media. So the, so the media and the games media were, were less interested in the non-player character stories that we had generated, the arcs about the emperors and the, and the kings and whatnot of our game, but they were really interested in what our players were doing. This story, for example, t uh, was a story about a player called Miriel, which had a corporation of about 100 players, which was an Amarian. The Amarians are theocratic zealots in, in the, in the role-playing sense, and they were actually role-playing a lot. But it was a very successful corporation called Ubika Seraf. And uh, Miriel was befriended by a player called, Am called Aramis. And though these are actual people, and Aramis became friends with Miriel in-game and, uh, and gained her trust. Of course, this was a dude, but he was playing a, a woman. And gained her trust and became her second in command within the corporation gaining access to the corporate coffers, to like the corporation wallet, to different uh, starship uh, hangars. But what she didn't know was he and a lot of other people that recently had joined the corporations were members of a corporation called the Guiding Hand Social Club, which is a mercenary outfit within EVE Online. So these were players who intentionally are mercenaries and, and do jobs for people that pay a lot. So there was this person, which was referred to as the client, we don't know who that was, who paid Aramis and, and the Guiding Hand Social Club a tremendous amount of in-game currency to assassinate Miriel, steal her, all her stuff. So at, at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning, Aramis convinces Miriel to take out her most precious ship, something that, uh, it was a unique ship in game, it was, it was kind of uh, invaluable in a way, because there was only one of them in game. It couldn't be, like, it would be worth thousands of dollars on eBay if, if somebody would try to sell it. So he convinces her to take it out for a spin around the space station to do screenshots, because there was nobody in the system. And, and usually Miriel would never undock in the system. It was just a prized possession. But she's, okay, I'll just do it to, like, take, take screenshots. Once she's out, 
all of his friends log on, meaning that they appear in space just next to the ship, attack her, he attacks her, destroys the, the priceless ship, uh, then destroys her escape capsule and captures her frozen corpse. At the same time, his colleagues all around the, uh, all around the space empty out the corporation coffers and the, uh, the space station hangars of all of the assets of Ubiqua Seraf, essentially uh, conducting a heist, a movie-like heist in, uh, of a corporation which felt very real. A corporation that Miriel had been building up for months. And this wasn't like this wasn't even fun or games for them. This was serious, serious stuff. This was real betrayal. And and this story yeah, got picked up by PC Gamer. It was like a four-page coverage. And, uh, and since then, a lot of stories have been picked up by the media about things that happened in Eve which we didn't write, which our players did about uh, heists, about frauds, about robberies, about massive space battles which occurred, or uh, about the economy and, and inflation, or there was actually deflation at one point in, in the economy, and we had like a PhD economist which was working on, uh, the, uh, on, on managing and observing the economy for us. Uh, but, but very frequently in these articles, we would see these comments, oh, I love Eve, it's my favorite game to read about but I could never be bothered with playing it, which is, of course, kind of a bummer. But these are our players. These are pictures that Vice took of our players at our uh, annual gathering in Iceland, which is called FanFest. We do these gatherings all around the world. We recently had one in Las Vegas, and we had another one in New York uh, a couple of months ago. But, uh, but th this one is the biggest. Uh, this one uh, occurs in Iceland every year, and uh, I think roughly like 1,500 players come from all over the world, fly to Iceland to spend three days. It's kind of like a hajj, you know, it's kind of like this. If you're an EVE player, you have to do this at least once in your lifetime. It's a big moment uh, for them. And uh, this is where they mingle with the devs, get, <laughs> listen to keynotes, but most importantly, contribute their opinions and views and suggestions back into the game. Because that has been a stronger and stronger theme in the story of the game that, the, uh, that it's not a one-way street. It's not just designs that are made by designers and then the gamers kind of do what, uh, do what we tell them, but rather it has been a very uh, ongoing dialogue with the, with the players. What do they want in game? What should be next? What, what do they prefer? And, uh, and the game play, uh, players are very empowered in the sense and, and very uh, kind of engaged in the development of the game, more so than in a lot of other games. They're also very passionate. We, tried op we opened up a tattoo parlor, more of it as a joke, at FanFest a couple of years ago, where people could adorn them with tattoos from the game, and, and it became like super popular, and, and, and a lot of people go home with like the UI of the game tattooed to their body or logos or whatever. So, so to them, it's, it's a bit like being a member of a football club or... Uh, I don't know, um, a unit in the military or something like that. It's a part of your lifestyle. It, it's, it's, it's a hobby and sometimes it's more of a hobby. It's kind of what they define themselves as. And it's not a very solitary thing. That's also another thing which, uh, you know, I, when I'm talking about the game, very commonly people have this image of, of a person being alone in their mom's basement, just, you know, playing utterly alone somewhere in space. But it's a very social and very communal, communal thing. But in 2011, uh, there was a big uproar. This dude was introduced into the game. And uh, what happened in 2011 is that we uh, introduced microtransactions to the game. Now, the game is a subscription game. People pay $15 a month to play the game. You can pay a little less. You can actually uh, not pay and have somebody else pay. But, but generally, you pay a subscription to the game. And uh, at this, at, in 2011, free-to-play and microtransactions were like taking the world by storm, and we were gonna be part of that party and, and introduce microtransactions. And our approach was to allow people to buy these clothes and monocles and, and items for customization, uh, including this monocle which sold for $65. And uh, the, the price of this monocle wasn't made public until the day that the expansion released, and at the, and at the same time, uh, a couple of unfortunate leaks were made from, without, uh, from within the company out to the community, resulting in a furious player base. And the, uh, and the player base was so furious that they rioted in-game. Now, how could they do this? What they did 
is in one of the largest market hubs within the game, they attacked a, a statue, which had no significance, but when thousands of them shot at the statue together, they were able to slow down our servers, actually putting uh, all trade in the game to a halt, because it was, this was the largest trade hub in the game. And remember, everybody, this half million people, they all share the same economy, and they basically shut down the stock exchange. They shut down trade in the game. Paralyzing the game and also were like cancelling in droves. Now, the game has a body called the Council of Stellar Management, a group of players which are elected by roughly kind of 30,000 people each year to represent the, the player community towards the devs. And they, are flow, they fly into Iceland two or three times a year and they meet with the devs. And up until this point, they, they had been kind of a weak force, more. Uh, they, they hadn't been that strong in the development of the game, and they had certainly not been consulted on the microtransactions. Uh, and as an, in an effort to reach out to the player base, there was an emergency uh, session of the Council of Stellar Management, meaning that they were flown in, like within a week's notice, from all around the world to Iceland to like, discuss with, with CCP and to discuss how we could resolve this conflict. And the then chairman of the CSM, the Council of Stellar Management, met with our senior producer, Arnar, and they reached an agreement on behalf of the players and the devs how to move forward, what changes should be made to the game. And they kind of set the tone for the next years, and the CSM has now become a more and more strong uh, uh, kind of force in the development of the game, even so much that uh, my fellow developers back in Iceland sometimes complain about it. They, they no longer like, have any effect or like, can't decide what to do with the game because the players have just taken it over. Now, going back to uh, the, uh, the stories, these, these incomprehensible stories, remember the UIs that I showed you, all these icons, how, how do we tell people these stories? A couple of years ago, we, we decided to make an effort to actually tell the stories to a wider audience, to try to capture these stories, capture the narrative of the game, and, and then broadcast it in different mediums, you know, in transmedia to other people. But we didn't have access to it. Some of them were just on forums, some of them were on blogs, some of them were just in people's minds. So we put up a crowdsourcing web website, kind of Reddit style, where people would submit their best stories from the game as their characters, and then discuss them and vote them up and down. What was their favorite story from the game? And, um, and we got, um, I think, a good 700 submissions. Uh, and, and the top story was actually submitted by this guy you saw earlier, the former chairman of the CSM. It's called the Mitani in game. It's, it's, his name is Alex in real life. And he's a lawyer, a retired lawyer who works in, lives in Wisconsin, but he leads Goonshorm, the largest uh, alliance in, or the then largest alliance in EVE Online. And the story, which was later published by Dark Horse Comics, was the story about how this uh, Carter, called Hargoth Agamar, betrayed the alliance that we was in, called Band of Brothers, which then was larger than Goonswarm, and actually eventually defected over to Goonswarm, over to the Mitanni, uh, who kind of wooed him in, and uh, caused one of the largest wars, and one of the largest battles that occurred, and, and the largest kind of transfer of power that ever happened within EVE Online. So, uh, so it was a difficult job trying to take discussions and, and dialogue, which had been basically happened on forums and things that had happened online, kind of in the meta space of the game, because not everything happens within the game client itself, and then translate that into board meetings or into conversations of fictional characters in space, which still looked like our players. But it, it turned out really well, and we're going to do more, more of this. Another effort that we are not, we're not finished with this one, is a television series we're developing with an uh, Icelandic director called Baltasar Kormagur. Baltasar, who's directed a number of Hollywood films and uh, pilot for HBO recently, and is uh, wrapping up a film called Everest with Jake Gyllenhaal. He is attached to uh, direct a uh, live action television series based on true stories from EVE Online. And we're working with a, uh, with a screenwriter and a production company in Hollywood to to uh, essentially create uh, a live action series uh, on a massive scale, set in space, 20,000 years from now, based on true events. And uh, furthermore, um, Eve has, has uh, kind of since gained a lot of recognition. 
This is a picture from the Museum of Modern Art where he was recently acquired into their permanent collection and was on display for a year, but actually sadly is no longer on display. It's just put into a box with a, next to a goat's head from Picasso. And, uh, and we're working with the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum in London right now to uh, develop another exhibit for EVE Online where it's going to be uh, on display in 2017. And the, and the future in general for EVE is bright. Uh, we're gaining subscribers right now. There are more and more players coming on board and uh, we're generally happy with where it's going. Now, uh, after the talk, I'm going to give you a little uh, demonstration of this game called Valkyrie, which was uh, originated from within the company. A few developers within the company got their hands on uh, an early version of the uh, Oculus headset. And uh, just in Unity, they collected a bunch of assets from EVE Online, which were pre-existing, threw it together in Unity and, and created a game rather rapidly for the Oculus headset. Showed it at our FanFest and it gained a lot of traction and popularity, a lot of press. Uh, wrote about it, so we brought it to a few other uh, shows like E3 and Game Developer Conference where it even got more and got some awards even though it wasn't really a game. So now there's a team working on it. We've built a team of like 35 people who are working on it and it's going to shape, it's going to be a launch title on the Oculus Rift. And it's quite a unique experience featuring this character called Raun who uh, has the voice of Katie Sakov from uh, Battlestar Galactica, where you're basically flying a small fighter, kind of in a first-person view, uh, being thrown out the launch tube of a large battleship and, and, and shooting down other spaceships in space. And uh, that's the end of it, and I hope you will like it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.